Hello, I'm David R. Jones of the Community Service Society. Welcome to the Urban Agenda. As we've done on prior editions of the Urban Agenda, we are joined today by another New Yorker who is seeking to become our next mayor. My guest is Tom Ognebeni, the former Republican leader of the City Council who served as a council member from Queens for 10 years. Welcome to the Urban Agenda. Great to be here. Well, I'd like to start, actually, we, we have obviously at CSS certain critical issues with the poor, but I'd like to get, as a, a Republican candidate against a Republican mayor, how is your campaign going? How well, is you see, your, your question kind of begs the answer, right. doesn't it? Is it really a Republican mayor? <laughs> Okay. And, and, I, and I think that's basically the uh, the issue. What What is it that the mayor stands for that's really Republican? I mean, yeah. if you're talking about simple things like uh, lowering taxes and not raising taxes, right. about standing up on social issues, about party building and believing in the party. I mean, here we have a Republican mayor who says or indicates he wants to endorse Hillary Clinton, maybe Elliot Spitzer. He's for gay marriage, uh, yeah. certainly not a core value in the Republican Party. Right. Uh, a partial birth abortion. So on social issues, he's not a Republican. And on economic issues, he's probably not a Republican either. I mean, he told me when he was going to run in 2001, he came and we spoke because I was a Republican leader. And he said, Tom, I've had an epiphany. I see that the, <laughs> it's the Republican way that made this city great in the 1990s. And I think that as a businessman, I'm going to take over. And our next step is going to be economic development. We're going to make sure that people want to stay in New York City. The one thing I will never do is raise taxes because it's regressive. Mm -hmm. uh, we'll never have a good growth in the city if we do that. He turned around and said, look, we can't cut government, which he promised to do. You know, we have obviously uh, the largest workforce in the country per capita of any major city, uh, Medicaid costs. I don't know what else to say. They're just so far out of control. It's not a matter of providing assistance to poor people. It's a matter of the fact that other states spend one half per capita and provide equal or better medical well, services. Well, how, so, talking about Medicaid, how would you address that uh, if you were mayor? You know how you address it? Very simple. The same thing that the mayor of Pittsburgh just recently did. Right. He wanted a commuter tax. The legislature wouldn't agree with him. He said simply, you know what I'm going to do? We're going to shut the bridges. We're not going to let anybody in. <laughs> and he said, he said, talk to the mayor of New York. And he said, the problem is when the mayor went up to Albany and asked for a commuter tax, he blinked. He said, when I demanded a commuter tax, the legislature blinked. See, if you have somebody like uh, Tom Swazi out in, 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 in NASA who says that there's only a certain amount that we should have to pay. Here's the state enforcing this mandate on us. What they right. do is they say, great. Uh, the, Health Care Reform Act, isn't it wonderful? You know, $47 billion. Who pays for it? New York City pays for most of it. They either pay 25% if there's coverage right. or 100%. You know the rules. The counties, too. So they're going broke on this. Tom Swosey says, you know what? We should establish a fixed amount that we think is appropriate for us to pay and not pay anymore. And I tell you, the, the mayor of the city of New York shouldn't be afraid to do that. You've got to draw the line in the sand, bring Albany to the table. If we don't do that, we're not going to be able to pay our cops. We're not going to be able to pay our firemen. We're not going to be able to pay our teachers. All the things in New York City that we have to do, we can't do because we're burdened unnecessarily, particularly by Medicaid and health costs. I guess the blinking problem is since most of the Medicaid uh, monies go to deal with long-term care for the elderly. Right. I mean, can we really <laughs> well, here's the interesting stand and thing. do it? Sure, I, I think so because let's take a look at that. California spends several billion dollars less than we do, and they got 15 million more residents. Mm -hmm. The mayor says the reason we don't want to cut Medicaid is because we don't want to hurt the poor. But it's not the acute care that's really the problem. It's the long-term care that's way out of whack. Right. I think California spends something like $8 billion. We play close to $17 billion, $10 billion more. That's where we're really being hurt. Now, sure, there are a lot of people hiding assets and going through a whole rigmarole, but right. I think in, 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 if you look at it, and really analyze it. And you look at the program that Odyssey Partners had set up that right. was commissioned by the, uh, by the governor. Mr. Berger made a nice presentation to us about what you can do to provide as equal uh, a benefit and care to the people and do it at half the price. And I think that we're not looking at that. We're just running blindly in and saying, let's raise money, even the budget. You know, they had a budget settlement uh, in Albany that wasn't a budget settlement. 
You and I know it, that major components weren't settled on. Right. It looks good politically, everybody smiled, but ultimately they're going to have to go back to the table, and the biggest component is going to be that Health Care Reform Act component. What do you think? The mayor has obviously made a part of his campaign around the question of his reform of education. As, as a potential mayor, how would you confront the education crisis? In well, the I, 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 the problem with education is that you, you have to want to be educated. Education really in New York City is an opportunity, uh, not necessarily a right. I think that with so much information that's available to kids today about what's going on in the world, that the schools have become irrelevant. They don't see it as important. I don't think parents see it as important. I don't see the kids see it as an important component of their lives. I think we need more uh, technical and vocational training. I, 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 I think it's not realistic to expect that every child has the capacity or the energy to want to go on to college at a certain level in their life. I was somebody who who had the light go off in my head uh, later on in life after I went in the military service. Mm -hmm. But I think that there are a lot of skills in a lot of industries. You know, years ago, know. you got a college <clears throat> education, then you went on maybe to law school or some professional right. school, because that's the only way that you could make a good living. Nowadays, there are many jobs available in the, both the technical and vocational fields, particularly because of unions and other wage earning and collective bargaining agreements, where there are, you have the capability of earning a lot of money. Well, electricians earn 125000 sure. 135000 a year. You know, but the kids have to have those skills, and they have to be taught that if they acquire those skills in high school, so. then, then a lot of worlds will open up to them. You, I, you'll be happy to know we actually did a poll of low-income New Yorkers uh, last year. Uh, which asked this very question, and the, the results were outstanding. 93 percent sure. of the people we polled say they want more technical and vocational education. Ninety percent said they wanted it for their kids. Right. So there is a there is an issue here that transcends party labels on technical and voc. I mean, but I don't know. If, you see, I don't know about the, if it transcends party labels. You know, because the, I don't think the mayor yet has focused on that issue. I think, unfortunately, what the mayor has done to me, and it's very sad. My mother was a school teacher and principal. Uh -huh. My wife was a school teacher. And my wife despises what the mayor's done with education because she sees him as scripting education. He got control of it. And when I say scripting it, uh, it's directed from the Tweed building. And they're telling administrators, principals, and teachers in the classroom, this is what you'll teach from 10 to 1015. This is what you'll teach from 1015 to 1045. And it's directed at raising up scores, a couple of percentages, so they can beat their breasts and say, look, isn't it a wonderful job Excellent. we've done? We've raised up. But they've denied discretion, creativity to the teacher. My wife would tell me when I'm teaching kids and they're on a subject and they're involved and it's quiet in the classroom and they're learning and they're asking questions, the classic Socratic method. If you can get them to ask a question, you've opened their mind. She said, that's missing. So you, it's like you're force feeding these kids enough to learn so that they can go take a test to get a few points higher, but they're not learning. They're not using education to become creative in their own lives. So he's really failed at education. I believe he's taken a step backwards. Now, what about the mismatch between teacher salaries just beyond the, the borders of New York? Obviously, there's been a CFE decision. There are all sorts right. of stuff going on. Legislature has, is not doing anything about it at this right. point. And but, never will. <laughs> well, do you think, do you think that's yeah, well, true? They, they'll I mean, leave it The campaign for order. fiscal equity is, it, 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 it's, I understand its intent and its purpose and, right. and, and the judge's decision, but the legislature is not a party to that action. So I don't know, in our system of government, whether a judge can order the state legislature to, put, to, to, to fund a, a particular part of a budget. I, I really don't think that under, I think if it went to the Supreme Court, the Supreme Court said we're not going to hear this case. That's my sense. Because the last thing we need in this country is to have a the judicial branch direct how the legislature, the people elected by the people, are going to spend their money. In any event, they weren't made a part of the lawsuit, so I don't know how he could issue any order that can compel them to do it. I guess what they were ba basing this on, obviously, was the state constitution, which calls for a certain sound basic education, and that's what the right. court was well, ruling but on. Who, who, who makes that determine? Who makes that determination? A sound basic, look, well, the court to me, you, the problem is you have to fix the school system before you put the money in. And, and it, it's sad to say, and I certainly hope that the teachers can make more money, and I certainly hope that the schools are more disciplined and there's less violence right. and less disruption. But if you look at the problems that plague our schools today, they have very little to do with money and more to do with the lack of priority that families and children are giving to education. In my belief, yeah. that I don't think that when I was growing up, education was the, 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 the means to an end. It was the way that you got out. 
Uh, my mother and father were Italian immigrants. My mother was a, a school teacher. My father was a painter. Mm -hmm. But they said their children got to go to school. My brother became a doctor. I became a lawyer. My other brother was in the insurance industry and very well respected, right. a regional vice president, a Royal Globe in Nashville. And my mom just made a study. And my mom just stressed school to us. And my mom did everything uh, to focus on, uh, you know, on education. And we realized that that was the way out. I lived on 139th Street between Amsterdam and Hamilton Place. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I did all the things that kids love to do. But I found that I had certain advantages. Now, when I was growing up, certainly in, in, in the 50s and 60s, Teaching there were course. things that, that held kids back that I, I think are not the same obstacles today. There were a lot of kids that were bright, but because of racial and ethnic considerations, didn't, didn't advance. They were, like, they were a lot smarter than I, than I was, didn't have the money that my family did to push, push me through. No, we, but, we, we hear you. I guess the, the difficulty, obviously, is when you start to analyze who the teachers are in the very poorest neighborhoods, most of them aren't certified in any subject. We really have, and most of them are per diem and substitutes, right. and they, can't, they don't even have mastery of one subject. And that really becomes a double hit against what you're talking right. about. It becomes an even worse problem because you have the least qualified and the least you know, trained teachers and the least mentored teachers. So it exacerbates a problem that's already there. I just get angry, obviously, when I visit schools like uh, in Brownsville. And I look, they have, everything's broken, the gym is, it's not working. And then I look at Stuyvesant, which has 13 million spent on the bridge alone. I understand that, but you know, I, I get complaints in my community where the schools are, are, are pretty good because they say to themselves, yeah, the, there are certain schools that have endowments and have people that, that uh, certainly Stuyvesant High School is this elitist school. But there's a lot of things that you can do for the schools. But my problem is until we convince kids and families that education really is a mechanism by which you can achieve in this society, I don't know that's going to make as significant a difference as it should. Well, I think that's why we should talk seriously about yeah. technical and voc ed. Oh, because absolutely. Because I think a wage has a lot to do with it in this culture, and I think we can talk about that. Okay. We'll be right back to continue the urban agenda. You don't have to be a hero to be a hero. When you adopt a child from foster care, just being there makes all the difference. We're speaking today with former city councilman Tom Ognebeni, who is challenging Mayor Bloomberg for the Republican Party's nomination for mayor. Tom? Hi. When I mentioned the, the, the poll we did earlier, uh, one of the findings that was uh, also coming out like a shot were people were desperate around housing issues. Yeah. Uh, you know, we had nearly 50 percent of uh, the thousand polled who were in this category of poor who said that the thing that kept them up every night was around housing. Either they had uh, been evicted or feared eviction or right. just couldn't pay the rent. Uh, many of them, if not the majority of them, were working and still right. not able to meet yeah. the rent costs in, in New York. What do, you, what do you see, I mean, as, well, as a potential mayor? Well, one, one of the problems is if, you, if you're going to raise real estate taxes 33 percent, you know landlords are going to pass that down uh, to tenants. So one of the biggest mistakes that the mayor did, and it affects everybody, not just tenants, but cooperators with maintenance charges and right. condo owners. Uh, but one of the things that we should be concentrating on really is, is affordable housing. And I think that we have to look at our rent laws, and I'll explain the, the, mm -hmm. exactly what I mean. First of all, there are great programs out there. you got 80-20, 60-40 housing, right. where you get the private industry to come in and, and rehabilitate. I'm not so sure that you have to have the 60-40 the or 80-20 mixed in the same project. Just to in other give, words, give our audience some okay. understanding, because I, I, I know it, but only because I've been around you right. guys for a long time. <laughs> right. It, it, in other words, a developer comes in, he could develop 80% of his housing could be luxury or market value housing, right. and he has to create 20% of that housing uh, uh, for poor or you know middle to, to, to poor mm -hmm. uh, income people, so that right. if you built 100 units, 80 would go to the wealthy, not necessarily the wealthy, but you know but certainly market value, more, and et cetera. Right. 
they do them sometimes, and they do it in the same project. I don't believe in that. I believe that you know you you could build up all of your your your, your wealthy housing in one area, and then go into communities where there's a lot of housing that needs rehabilitation, and rehabilitate that housing using the twenty uh, using using that formula. It right. doesn't have to be in the same project. I think right. that would work. Two, I have a real problem with the rent stabilization system, and I'll mm -hmm. tell you why. Not that you do away with it completely at first to a free market system. But the problem is, is that you've got apartments that are stabilized, and you may have an apartment that's stabilized at $1,500, as an example. And that apartment stabilized at $1,500, whether the person living there is making $500,000 a year or $20,000 a year. And the problem is that it creates a, 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 a false uh, a ceiling, for the, for, uh, and it, it, it's a benefit to those who make a lot of money, and it's an imposition to those who don't. But the landlord has to charge the $1,500. I'd like to see a system in which those who are able to more afford it, in other words, there's a scale, so that yeah. if you're making $500,000 a year, you shouldn't be paying $1,500. We, we actually did a study that showed that actually rent control and rent stabilization, right. because it was hitting a prior generation, right. is no longer linked as it once was with people who are actually poor necessarily. Right. So that's one thing you can look and completely yeah. restructure that so that a landlord uh, if he has 10 units, he could get eight units where he could get a 3,000 market rent, and then he could have two units, which he could make available to seniors or poor at $300, $400, $500. But he can't do that if he's forced uh, uh, to charge a rent which is right. below the mar what the market will carry for those who could otherwise what pay for it. What about Mitchell Lama? The Mitchell Lamas are now yeah. reaching their 20-year expiration. Right. A, a judicial ruling just came out saying that after it's over, people can go directly to market. Uh, some of the, we, we know that large numbers of people in Mitchell Lama are not going to be able to pay market. Well, how the, how the, do we the, cushion well, this kind well, of thing? Well, you can cushion it. The city council's been doing some of that. You know, we've been right. extending the legislation because of the, of the sunset provisions. Uh, Mitchell Lama uh, uh, served a tremendous purpose. And I know when I was in the council, I saw the problems that some of the people in Mitchell Lama would have worked with them. I had some in my right. district even, yeah, sure. uh, which was, which was Queens, unusual you know, over here. But we had some. Uh, and, and to me, that that's important, to, to create programs that make housing affordable for those that otherwise can't pay the market rents. But giving market, giving reduced rents, giving regulated rents to those who could otherwise afford it mm -hmm. is what's causing the problem in the city of New York, along with the fact that the mayor has, and I want to make it clear because I know this is a political year, the mayor foolishly raised taxes. And not only did he raise the percentage up, people have to understand this. The, the assessment values have continued to rise at a skyrocketing rate, particularly in what we know as class two properties. That's right. the residential properties. Mm -hmm. The oh, cap is 45 percent. So they can raise the assessments. And when they raise the assessments together with the tax rate, the taxes are tremendous. You know why they're converting places like the plaza to co-ops now? Because they can't afford to pay the taxes that are on them. People mm -hmm. are complaining now. And this is the problem. So the mayor's made a tremendous mistake, and he's done more to hurt affordable housing in the city of New York than any other mayor. And what do you, you, were, you were saying earlier, this, uh, the commuter tax was uh, obviously something that I think we were all stunned with. Yeah, well, the, the commuter tax obviously was a political ploy over a, a state senate race up in Rockland. Right. It was a disgrace both for Republicans and Democrats to do what they did because it was a minor imposition on those who use a tremendous amount of city services. It was $500 million. It's been gone now, what, five, six years? We're talking $3 billion. Right. So it was a bad mistake. But the mayor went up there, and the mayor... Uh, for a man who made four million uh, billion dollars in his lifetime, it's awful timid. <laughs> I mean, I would, I would have just, you know, and I told you the same thing that I would have done with, uh, uh, with the state, with, with the state legislature that the, that the mayor did in Pittsburgh. He has to stand up for New York City. He can't go up, and the governor could say, "We'll see you later," or Joe Bruno or Sheldon Silver. This is a problem that he's happened. Now, he stood tall on one issue, which was the silliest issue ever in New York, and this was this West Side Stadium. Well, let's talk about the West let's Side. It's, the it, West seem, Side it, it seems like it's defining this, this election. Well, in, in a lot of ways, it's defining the election, not because of the Jets or the, because the Jets want to have a stadium. Uh, what was interesting to me is the mayor said it couldn't be in Queens County. You remember that discussion? Yeah, I what remember. He said? But you remember what he said? It was interesting. Nobody picked up on it. He was talking about, we've got to have the stadium if we're going to get the Olympics. Right. Then well, he went that was out the to Queens, and that was it. And he said, the reason we can't put it in Queens is because we can't sell enough luxury boxes in Queens. Now, what do luxury boxes have to do with the Olympics? It was all about his friend Woody Johnson and getting him a stadium in Manhattan so that he could sell these luxury boxes. Now, I don't know what the stadium's going to do. I'm, I'm a Giants fan. I go out to Giants Stadium. We tailgate. 
I don't know whether you're going to have tailgating parties on 8th Avenue and get hit by a bus. I don't understand the efficacy of a West Side Stadium. But here's the thing that bothers me from a political point of view. Okay. Right. He was ready to give it away for $100 million. Now, everybody said the property is worth $900 million. I think more than that. Probably, may, probably more than that, but I'm being, I'm, I'm being generous because that's what they say. So there's a giveaway of $800 million. Now, Cablevision comes in. I don't know what their agenda was. Obviously, it's personal, but this is America. It's okay to have a personal agenda. They offer $400 million up front plus some incentives. The Jets come back with $250 million up front plus some silly developmental rights that will never take place. And guess what? They give it to the Jets for $250 million. So at least we got it up another $150 million. But what does that mean for you and me? Taxpayers are going to have to make an infrastructure investment of close to a billion dollars and maybe more. That's the way some people are estimating it. How are we going to pay for that? That's the money that can't go for one of the most important things we need in this city. I ride. I never go anywhere without my metro card. I take the subway system all over the city. I, I'd like to see it improved. It's the greatest system in the world. It can go anywhere. Leave the car home. Come to Manhattan. Ride the subways. We could have taken that $800, $900, a billion dollars and made real investment in, in the infrastructure uh, of the subway system and mass transit. No, we're not going to do that. We're going to make an investment for the New York Jets unnecessarily instead of building out in Queens County. And you and I are going to get a fair increase. I see it coming on January 1st after the election. And what do you see? I mean, the mayor comes back and obviously says this is going to be an, an incredible economic development boon and give all sorts of jobs to New Yorkers. He said 7,000. Well, it, others said 6,000. Right. Others said 3,000. They're going to have permanent jobs. If you look at it, there aren't that many permanent jobs. Here's the best economic development. Build it over the Sunnyside Yards. Build it out in Willits Point. You've got the same economic development, the same jobs that are created. And over in the Hudson Yards, you can build mixed-use, residential, you know, what we were talking about before, either 80-20 or 60-40 housing. You could put in commercial. You could make malls. You could beautify it. It's more conducive socially and economically to that venue. And you'd make a lot more money. Why? Because every one of those units would be paying real property taxes. And the New Jersey, Connecticut, and New York Regional Planning Association did a study, and they came up with three alternate plans, all mixed-use, residential, and commercial, that produced far more in a return on infrastructure investment than the stadium did. So it's not smart economically. It causes us to make a, an investment that we shouldn't have to make. It, it, it produces less jobs in my plan because we'd build a stadium in Queens, we'd have housing in Manhattan, we'd have two projects, produce a lot more jobs. It just doesn't make sense. It's the mayor doing favors for his friends, the same way they're doing with the Bronx Terminal Market and all these Olympic venues. And I guarantee, and I hope, because I know the Village Voice has done a very good job with investigating reporting, I want to see who's getting the benefit, the sweetheart deals, on all the proposed Olympic venues. And I guarantee in some way or another they have an association with Dan Doktoroff. Now, you've been going all around the city uh, talking to all sorts of constituencies. And what is coming back? Is, what, are, what are people talking to you about as they, they uh, talk about this? What, what seems to be on their minds rather than... Well, I, 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 I talk to a lot of Republicans, obviously. Yeah, well, I'd be and, interested. You know, but <laughs> you know, I mean, obviously... Well, I can't like, say some of my best friends, but I, you know, I know, yeah. <laughs> my well, daughter will not be with a Republican. Yeah, but that, other than that... <laughs> most of the Republicans around the city kind of... Obviously, that they see Mr... In other words... They see Bloomberg as a liberal Democrat, clearly. They, don't, they don't see it as part of theirs. No, yeah. I, absolutely not part of their agenda. And that's why I say people say, you're not spending a lot of money on your campaign. And I tell them I am. The, I spent over $5 million. How would you do that? I said, every time the mayor spends a dollar and opens his mouth, it accrues to my benefit. Here's a man who is ready to endorse uh, Hillary Clinton, ready to endorse Elliot Spitz. He's raising people's taxes. Nobody believes that he's a Republican, they feel very uncomfortable with him. When they talk to me, what they always worry about is they say, Mr. Agabeni, we love you. Even the counties that voted against me because he went in there and rigged it after I got Queens County Republican Party endorsement, and they all say to me, clearly, you're the better from a philosophical point of view. But if Mr. Bloomberg isn't there, then, then what do we wind up with? Mm -hmm. And my answer is simply this. If you look issue for issue, Michael Bloomberg is further left than any of the Democrat candidates in the race. And I tell him, take a long, hard look at it. And if you elect him after he's thumbed his nose at our party for four years, we will lose control of the Republican Party in the city of New York and in the state of New York, and we won't have a real agenda anymore. We're going to lose our two-party system. And I go in there and I tell people, look, stand up for me. 
The mayor just went with Lenore Filani the other night, gave her $250,000, wants the independence line, let him have it. Then we'll have a nice three-way race. Tom Ogilvie, Republican, Michael Bloomberg, Independent, whomever on the Democratic line, and let's see who has better ideas for the city of New York. But if you don't vote for me in the primary, you're going to wind up with a decision in November, and it's going to be the liberal Democrat incumbent or the liberal Democrat challenger. And if you, you limit yourself to that choice, you've abandoned the Republican Party. Well, thank you very much. My thanks to mayoral candidate Thomas Ogneveni, who is challenging Mayor Bloomberg for the Republican Party's nomination. I'm David R. Jones of the Community Service Society, and thank you for watching The Urban Agenda. To learn more about the work of the Community Service Society of New York or to comment on the Urban Agenda, please contact us at 212-614-5425 and on the web at www.cssny.org.